Please turn to Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9 uh, this morning. And as you turn there, allow me to thank you for a beautiful time of worship uh, Wednesday night. Um, those of you that were there, I'm sure, will agree. Your sermons were much better than mine, and your testimonies were a terrific encouragement uh, to the people of God. And so I'm already looking forward to, uh, to, to, to next year's, but... Uh, we read in the book of Revelation, they overcame the evil one by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And your testimonies were, were powerful and sweet and encouraging and glorifying to the Lord. So thank you and, and God bless you. As we come to the last chapter of Philippians, <clears throat> we come to just a, a list of loosely connected uh, instructions or exhortations And last week we looked at uh, verses 2 and 3 where the apostle uh, calls upon two women to stop their quarreling and uh, to get along with each other in the church, Euodia and uh, Syntyche. And uh, we were reminded that we are, in the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, to do all that we can to defend and to promote uh, our neighbor's good name. Or as Paul has said earlier in this letter, we're to regard others as more important than ourselves. We're to love others and serve others and uh, wash each other's feet, uh, symbolically if not, uh, if not uh, literally. Someone notes that it's a, it's a hard thing to throw stones when you're busy washing feet. Well said. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and um, we, we do pray that you give us grace to hear what you have to say and that you would rekindle in our hearts a love for you and a desire to serve you and worship you and bear testimony of your goodness uh, in our lives to those around us. Uh, Restore to us the joy of your great salvation, that we may indeed enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your resourceful, reasonable, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Well, the phrase that uh, caught my eye this week is a phrase that has never caught my eye before, and it is that little phrase at the end of verse 5, the Lord is at hand, or your version may say the Lord is near. And uh, first reading, I thought, well, Paul is talking about the second coming of Christ, the second advent, uh, which the Bible always says is imminent and therefore we're to be ready at any moment he may come like a thief in the night but there's another way to look at that phrase as well which is to understand that the Lord is is near us spiritually what the theologians call his omnipresence and because he is near to us uh, it, it should make a difference if if Jesus was next to you on, the, on your row right now, you'd, you'd probably uh, be a little more attentive, wouldn't you? Or if Jesus walked through that door and he said, uh, Jim, enough of your boring sermon. Let me have that pulpit. We're going to hear some real preaching today. Uh, chances are you'd, you'd sit up and you'd really pay attention to that, wouldn't you? Well, the Lord 
is near to us at all times. He is omnipresent. And just as you remember that great story in the Old Testament where Elisha's servant was so uh, uh, fearful uh, because he saw the Syrian army uh, outside his door uh, gathered to wage war against the people of God. Uh, and Elisha prayed that the servant's eyes might be open, and they were. And what did he see? He saw the armies of the Lord. and saw horses and chariots of fire surrounding the Syrians, which the Syrians couldn't see. And that servant knew that the Lord is near and that all would be well as a result. So the Lord is near us. He is on the pew with us today. He, I hope he's here with me. We, 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 we talk every time before I get up here. I say, please don't leave me alone up there. <clears throat> so because he's with us, near us, we are to be joyful. First of all, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Twice he said it. Maybe he feared the people were hard of hearing. And so when this was read, he wanted it read twice. Uh, more likely, he wanted it read twice, repeated twice for emphasis. Rejoice, people, because the Lord is near. Uh, a joyful Christian is a wonderful testimony to the love and grace of God. A joyful church is a place people like to be. By contrast, a joyless Christian or joyless church, as others have pointed out, is one of the devil's greatest instruments. So rejoice. And in case you didn't hear it the first time, again I say rejoice. <laughs> the Lord is near. You may say, well, preacher, you don't understand my situation. I can't be rejoice. I'm just beset behind and before by trials and tribulations. I've got family issues and health issues and uh, love life issues and money issues and I simply, simply can't be joyful. Well, I remind you that the man who wrote this letter had jail issues, right? He was incarcerated. He had uh, execution issues. He didn't know if he had a tomorrow. Or if he had one, if, if he didn't know if the next day would be his last day. And yet this man was full of joy, as we've seen time and again uh, in this book. Chapter 1, verse 3, I thank my God in all remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 18, <clears throat> What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And I could just take a lot of time and make you late for lunch. Time and again, the apostle uses that word joy and rejoice in this little uh, book of four chapters. Despite the fact he was in jail and despite the fact he was facing possible execution. Daniel had execution issues as well. By the way, my apologies, that was the wrong text that King read a little bit earlier. It was a lovely text, wasn't it? Just wasn't the one I wanted to have read, so I put the wrong text in the bulletin today. I do make mistakes, and this one's on me, but it was supposed to be chapter 6 verses, what is it, 6 through 10, and you got chapter 5 verses 6 through 10, but in chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, this is what you get. See, that one didn't really have anything to do with Thanksgiving. <laughs> Again, it was a lovely text, so that's just a, a bonus text for you this morning. Then the presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O oh, King D Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, these are all the big shots. They're all agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction 
that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. That irrevocable law of the Medes and Persians was an execution decree for Daniel, but it didn't make a bit of difference to the prophet. He went home and he opened the windows toward Jerusalem and got down on his knees, not once, not twice, but three times a day and prayed and gave thanks as he'd always done. The threat of... Uh, being the lion's supper didn't rob him of his joy and thanksgiving. So, rejoice in the Lord, no matter the circumstances. The joy that Paul is talking about here is a supernatural joy, impervious to circumstances, so that Always and everywhere and in every circumstance, we understand that our lives are held in our Father's loving hands and that we belong, body and soul, life and death, not to ourselves, but to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all of our sins and completely freed us from the dominion of the devil and who protects us so well that without the will of our Father in heaven, not one single hair can fall from our heads. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice, because the Lord is near. He's not far away. It's not that he doesn't care and lives way out there. No, he's, he's near. Secondly, Pray. Pray with thanksgiving. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Pray without ceasing, he says elsewhere. Peter says, cast your cares on the Lord because the Lord cares for you. You suffer from anxiety, pray. Try prayer before you try Prozac. <laughs> pray. Because when we pray with a grateful heart, something interesting happens. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. Prayer leads to peace. And what leads to prayer? The nearness of the Lord. Because it is hard to talk to a stranger, isn't it? It's hard to talk to somebody that's distant and aloof and doesn't care and lives way out there. But if the Lord is near us, as He is, if He's with us, if He's in us, as we know He is through the Holy Spirit, well, you have to be a pretty unfriendly person to shun someone who's your constant companion, don't you? And lo, he said, I will be with you even to the end of the age. He is with us. And so we pray with thanksgiving. And anxiety is beat, defeated. And there's this beautiful peace that passes understanding, again, a supernatural peace. 
one of my uh, more cynical golf buddies uh, says that uh, the only way to have peace that passes understanding is to give up golf. <laughs> well, I sort of understand that, <laughs> to be honest with you. But uh, Jesus, or Paul rather here, is not talking about the kind of peace the world gives. Jesus said, I don't, peace I give you not as the world gives. The, the, the peace that the world offers is, is hollow. It's about as, it's about as valuable as that piece of paper. Neville Chamberlain, you remember this from your history studies, waved about, peace in our time, he said, after meeting with Adolf Hitler. And what followed, of course, was one of the greatest bloodbaths in human history. And that's not the kind of peace that the Lord gives. It's a peace that, that passes understanding, that rests in the reality that we are known because he's near and we're loved and we're understood and we're comforted and we have this wonderful confidence and conviction that all things work together for our good in this life. And in the life to come, we will be with people we love in a place we love and we'll be there forever and nothing can jeopardize that. So no matter all the circumstances, all the difficulties and travails of this life, though the mountains may quake and the waters may uh, foam, and the kingdoms may totter, and the nations may rage, and the peoples may plot, in spite of all that stuff, the people of God have access to a river. The psalmist says there's a river whose streams make glad the people of God, the city of God. And we're blessed with peace like a river. And all hell breaks loose. Peace like a river and righteousness like the waves of the sea. You know the story behind that hymn we sung just a moment ago? Now thank we all our God. Great hymn. It was written by a German pastor in 1636. Nearly 20 years into the 30 years war. And his parish was racked by economic disaster disease and death 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 15 people a day he buried for a year over 5,000 people in a year's time and amid all that death and destruction and hostility and bloodshed with literally with cries of fear outside his window this German pastor sat down one night and wrote a blessing for his children to say <laughs> at mealtime. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom his world rejoices who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Oh, may this bounteous God through all our lives be near us. And on and on it goes. And that was the context in which he wrote that great hymn of praise we continue to sing. Now thank we all our God. And I'll tell you, we got a taste of it Wednesday night. For those of you that were here, uh, uh, to, to hear the testimonies of people whose lives aren't necessarily great, I mean, so many of the ones who raised their hands and spoke of the goodness of God were our cancer patients, were they not? <laughs> Been through surgery, perhaps still going through treatments, or a loved one is, is in such a condition. But I didn't hear anxiety, and I didn't hear fear. I heard gratitude and even joy and peace beautiful thing so rejoice in the lord and be anxious for nothing but pray with thanksgiving and third i don't really know how to say this but uh paul says we're to exercise for lack of a better way to say it mental discipline finally brothers we're saying whatever's true Whatever's honorable, 
whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Look for the good in people. Look for the good in life. There is so much in this world God's made that is pure and beautiful and lovely and excellent and praiseworthy. There's an article uh, written in uh, Parent Magazine here recently. I don't read Parent Magazine anymore, but someone in our family does. You can, you can figure that out. And she shared it with me, uh, Michael Aldrich writes of his four-year-old's prayer one night, Ezra. Ezra prayed, Dear God, thank you for mommy, daddy, baby sister, grandma, Grammy. He began and proceeded to list pretty much everyone in the extended family, but he didn't stop there. Thank you for red, orange, yellow, green, he went on to list every color he could think of. The detour delighted my artist wife and left us both amused and surprised. It had never really occurred to us to thank God for colors. But why not? As grown-ups, it's easy to take the things we see every day for granted. Even the amazing palette of colors that enliven our world beyond the hues of black and white and gray. But on this night, a child's simple prayer of gratitude reminded us that our world truly is a stunning sight to behold. So simple, isn't it? Blue sky and red trees. And one of the things I like about playing golf is hitting a white ball against the blue sky falling softly on the green grass, <laughs> the short green grass. <laughs> I don't like it if it's that high grass over there. God has made a, a beautiful world, and so we're to think not just on the colors, but on the unspeakable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, on his unfailing love for us on the fact there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, on the fact that the people of God do a lot of good in this world today through Operation Christmas Child Shoebox and any number of, of ministries. Now there's, by contrast, as you well know, there's a lot of poison in the world too. And it's nearly impossible today to avoid it. But in the words of Proverbs 4, above all else, Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. It's one of the hardest things we do, quite honestly. And the reason is this. It's secret. It's going on in here and going on in here. And nobody knows it but you and me. <laughs> but we can be involved in a conversation with someone, and our mind can be a million miles away and dwelling on very ungodly things if we're not careful. Some of you are old enough to remember when Jimmy Carter was president and uh, he admitted in an interview that he still struggled with lust. And the comics laughed and the journalists sneered and made fun of him because no one could see their lust easy to laugh at somebody else's lust when no one can see yours. So guard your heart because out of it flows the wellspring, the issues of life. And what's in here will eventually come out of here or in our lives in, in some way. Both, both of our sons played football years ago and I'll never forget when our youngest had a middle school game, important game, one that we thought it was important. He thought it was important. We lost, I think. But what I remember most clearly about the game was uh, we, uh, Kristen and I had just taken our seats uh, around the, not many people go to those middle school games, so we were 50-yard line, and the game's about to get started, and I said, look, look, 
uh, Kristen, and there they were down on the field, and every boy had, was on one knee and had his helmet off, and his head was bowed, and the coach was standing in the, in the middle of them or in front of them, and he had his, his head bowed. And I said, I think the coach is having a prayer with the team before the game. And uh, they went on and played the first half, and halftime they went off to a corner somewhere or the locker room and came back for the second half. And, and afterward, uh, uh, you have to understand, now John was hot, tired, mad, and hungry. <laughs> Not a good combination. But um, we're driving home. I said, hey, John, it, it looked like your coach uh, looked like he was praying with y'all before the game, was he? And John was quiet for a moment. He said, yeah, yeah, he, uh, he prayed with us before the game. Then there was this pause, and then he said, and then he cussed us out at halftime. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we're usually pretty careful about what we say and do in front of other people on the 50-yard line. But we get off in that locker room at halftime or by ourselves, and what's in here will very often come out. So guard your heart, because no man can tame the tongue until he's first guarded his heart. And while this is one of the hardest things that we will ever do, it's also one of the most important things, because the heart wields the greatest influence, does it not? Out of it flow the issues of life. And I must tell you, many a otherwise fine person, believer, a Christian leader, deacon, elder, pastor, too many times, under the boastful pretense of Christian liberty, has flirted with things that are poison to the heart and that weaken the conscience and the result far too often has been a dreadful fall into sin with devastating consequences. Above all, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. Or, as Paul said elsewhere, you who stand, take heed lest you fall. Let's pray. For, Lord, please fill us with your spirit and give us uh, grace that we may understand your nearness and rejoice in it and behave accordingly and think accordingly and worship and praise you accordingly and serve your people accordingly. Thank you for your nearness. May we be joyful and content and peaceful and full of gratitude for your countless gifts of love that you've blessed us with from our mother's arms to this very day. And uh, give us grace to see this beautiful world you've made and how you uh, govern it and maintain it, how you uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures' actions and things from the greatest to the least. So enable us to think on that which is pure and good and true and lovely and, and praiseworthy, that, that our mouths may declare your praise forever and ever through Christ our Lord. Amen.